Hey guys, welcome back to day 14, acid-base definitions. Well, first, let's review aqueous equilibria. So we're going to review aqueous, aqueous equilibria. Recap, we have the solvent, which of course is the major component. It's present the most. And for our purposes, aqueous, of course, H2O will be our solvent. Then comes the solute, which, of course, the solute is the minor component of the solution. And there's two types of solutes that we're going to talk about. We have, and you probably remember this from Chem 1, you have non-electrolytes and we have electrolytes. And definition is non-electrolytes do not conduct electricity. They, they're not conductors. Electrolytes, the solution, does conduct electrons, electricity. Well, now, we know all water kind of conducts a little bit because all water has some salt in them, right? We have, your, if you wash your car, some people wash their car all the time. Some people, very rarely, if not, never. You wash your car, though. Let's say you wash your car, and you don't dry off the car. What happens? Well, you get all these little water spots. We call them water spots, but they're not water spots. The water is actually gone, especially where, where I live, you know, eastern North Carolina. The sun really does, it's intense. It's definitely not the most intense on the planet, but it's an intense sun. You're left behind what was dissolved in the water, which is the salts. And this happens with, if you do dishes, and you sometimes see it on glassware. So there's stuff in the water. So there's a certain amount of salts in the water, even in fresh water. And then, of course, we add more and more. It becomes what we call brackish, and then it becomes salt water and, and whatnot. Fresh water, which a very, very low solution of, of ions, still can conduct a little bit, not much but it's not going to complete a circuit. So when we talk about this came from, if you had a beaker, let's say, with a solution in there, you had a battery, and one terminal goes to like a light bulb, and then we come in the other terminal will that solution will this light bulb shine will it shine the non-electrolyte it will not shine the electrolytes it will shine now there's two types of electrolytes there are strong and weak so when it comes to electrolytes there are weak electrolytes and of course there are strong electrolytes when we got come for weak and strong we know they conduct electrons poorly and conduct electrons, let's call it well. So the light bulb is bright for strong electrolytes. Weak electrolytes make a dim light bulb, but it's on, and non-electrolytes, there's no light bulb. That was the observation. We now know that non-electrolytes have no ionization or dissociation of ions or particles. Weak, we have very little ionization. Strong is near complete ionization. Near complete or complete. ionization. So what do we have? We have K, the equilibrium constant K. K is extremely small or zero. So like your molecules and whatnot. For weak, K is small. And for strong, 
k is large. All right, the equilibrium constant tells us, k tells us how far the reaction proceeds, so non-electrolytes, k is extremely small or zero, it doesn't even exist. Weak electrolytes, k is small, usually less than a thousand. And strong electrolytes, k is big. So how do I tell which I have? What do I have? So non-electrolytes, anything solid, liquid, gas, molecules, right? Those are non-electrolytes. Strong electrolyte and weak electrolyte. Strong electrolytes, we have all soluble salt, which are, of course, ionic compounds. So any ionic compound that dissolves, it's a strong electrolyte. That's one class. Second class, strong acids. So we have seven strong acids. HCl, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, sulfuric, nitric, perchloric, and chloric. And a little note here. Only the First, hydrogen and sulfuric is considered strong. Weak acids are other acids. Now, are there more than seven strong acids in the world? Yes. For example, HPF6 is a strong acid. I didn't know that until I used it much after chem one i will tell you if it's a strong acid if it's not one of these seven that's how i operate the course i don't expect you to, to know well that's probably a strong acid no we'll, we'll talk about what factors that affect strength and all that stuff the point is you will not have to you only have to know these seven so what are some of the weak acids h3po4 hcn HF, H2CO3, I can go on, CH3COOH, HNO2, on and on and on and on and on. Now, at this point, I usually like to reiterate all that strong and weak means is how well they conduct electrons, not how dangerous or toxic or how do you have to handle it. Reason I say that is that one is in our stomachs. Hydrochloric acid is in our stomach. This one kills a lot of people, millions of people in Europe. This one dissolves glass. It's really nasty, and it it you do not want to get it on your hand. If you get a little bit of HCl in your hand, it depends on the concentration. Obviously, twelve molar concentrate would be very bad. It's painful, but it's again, they're they're all dangerous and they're all safe at the same time. Just like anything, water water can kill a lot of people. You can drown in water. However, you need it to live. So there's so when we talk about acids, one of the things I had a big problem when I was in your shoes is that I thought strong meant dangerous, weak meant safe. That's not true. Strong just means it conducts electricity well, which means the H plus separates from the um, anion, either A minus or the, the polyatomic ion. Weak, it doesn't completely separate in solution. That's all, that's the whole difference. I wanted to point that out. Next thing, strong electrolytes would be strong bases. And we got, of course, weak bases. So strong bases at this point, we're going to have our group one and two hydroxides and oxides. So a little foreshadowing, strong bases would be OH minus. O2 minus and S2 minus. Those are our three species that are going to be strong bases in this course. 
the reason oxide is strong would be O2 minus plus H2O liquid Q going to uh, basically OH minus and OH minus or two OH minus. So that's why it's a strong base. That's why calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide basically are the same thing to us. Sulfide is very similar. It will always go. Now I draw it one way. Technically it's in equilibrium, but it's going one way. H, S minus, and hydroxide. That's why they're strong bases. However, the whole compound is a base. So when we talk about group one, group two metals, I got lithium, hydroxide, obviously hydrogen hydroxide would be water, doesn't count. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, and cesium hydroxide. You got B, E, well, let's give a space. I got plenty of space. Beryllium hydroxide. You have magnesium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide. I always throw down calcium oxide, too. We have strontium hydroxide and barium hydroxide. These two are what we use our most co common, chemist most common. And why are they the most common? Because they're one to one, one hydroxide per one mole of base, and they're very soluble. Sodium salts, potassium salts, very soluble. Lime. Is probably the world's most common base. Now, rubidium and cesium hydroxide are also very strong bases, and there we're going to put down too dangerous. They dissolve the beaker they're in. That's lovely. BOH2 is actually a covalent compound. And these guys are less soluble which means they don't dissolve quite fully they don't make a clear colorless solution now they'll still react as a strong base so that's what we're talking that way but they're not necessarily strong base weak base the weak base will be nh3 and its derivatives which means anytime I have nitrogen with a lone pair, it's going to be a base. It doesn't matter if there's a double bond, three single bonds, does not that, that's irrelevant. Now, note, anytime you have NH+, plus, you know, whatever whatever's in front of it, so that means if you have NH+, plus, doesn't matter, that's going to be... We're going to learn that's an acid because of the H plus. So any, anytime you have N, nitrogen think base, unless it's N plus, NH plus, then it's acid. So now let's go to the definitions. Let's talk about definitions. So in Chem 1, we had the Arrhenius definition. He had acids, Arrhenius acids. And Arrhenius basis. Great definition. So an acid was it produces H plus or H3O plus because they're the same thing in solution. Bases produce OH minus in solution. And that was a very good definition for acids and bases. However, it wasn't necessarily complete because some things that did not necessarily or directly produce hydroxide were basic. Some things that did not produce, didn't look like it could produce H 
plus were acidic. Then Bronsted Lowry came along. So Bronsted Lowry, they came up with their definition for acids and bases. Their definitions probably are number one definition of acids and bases for aqueous systems. Lewis, which we'll get to later on, Lewis is a very good acid base definition and it applies to more towards organic systems. But in water, we have protons. So an acid in the Bronsted Lowry definition is an H plus or proton donor. And a base is an H plus or proton acceptor. So now we're in donor acceptor theory. What do we mean? So let's take a strong acid, HCl. And we're going to add that to NH3. Well, what's going to happen here? Now, technically, it can come back the other way, but we'll get Cl minus plus NH4 plus. So we have an acid. We have a base. Well, what happens here is now we have this proton, and I'll draw this proton here goes to nitrogen. Okay, and so it's kind of like playing catch. If you play catch, if you have the ball or you're waiting for the ball, whether it's baseball, softball, soccer, even, uh, you know, it's not catch with your feet, but it's still passing the ball back and forth. Football. Volleyball, even. If you have the ball, you're the acid. If you're waiting for the ball, you're the base. Once you get the ball, you go from waiting for the ball, the base. Now you have the ball, you're now the acid. The person that threw you the ball was the acid, but now they no longer have the ball. Now they're the base. And so the proton is going back and forth, just like the ball is going back and forth. Now, sometimes we know K equilibrium constant, K will tell us how far the reaction goes. So if the K is large, it pretty much stays on the product side. It's, a, it's definitely an equilibrium, so it's not static. It's a dynamic situation. Catch is being played, so to speak, with the proton. If K is large, it typically the proton is going to stay on the product side. If K is small, the proton is going to typically be more on the product side. Which means we have this thing called a conjugate base and a conjugate acid. And we have the pairs, so the acid and the conjugate base and the base and the conjugate acid. So acid-base pairs. It depends on which side we're looking at. Ammonia, let's do ammonia and water. Ammonia plus water going to ammonium. How did I know that? And hydroxide. How did I know that? Well, here's how I know that. N H H H H O H. Where can an H come from and where can an H go? That's the question. So what are the two options here? So ammonia can go to either. There's two options for ammonia. I can either go to NH2 minus or NH4 plus. I can either take an H away or add an H. Water. It can either go to H3O plus or OH minus. 
So which one's more likely? Well, NH2 minus is not as likely. It's not as likely because of formal charge. You'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It'd be minus two nitrogen. But we know ammonia is a base. We're told you that this is a base. So ammonia is a base. It's a weak base. Which means it's going to accept a proton. So water in this point is an acid. Then ammonium, once it's you know has the ball, has the proton, it would be the conjugate acid, and hydroxide is the conjugate base. Our pairs base and conjugate acid and acid and conjugate base. There we go. Next, let's try another one. HF plus water going to H what? Well, is HF going to gain a proton? No, H is written first. Hydrofluoric acid, how do you name it? So H3O plus and F minus. H is going to go from HF to water because HF is a weak acid. So I have an acid. I have a base. I have a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. Pairs again, base and conjugate acid, and oh, use a different color there, acid and conjugate base. And you might have noticed something real quick here. You might have noticed that water is an acid there and a base there. How can water be both? Well, it's fun. We're going to learn that acids and bases are technically relative terms, which means it's kind of like hot and cold. You may have been driving in the car with somebody and that somebody said, man, it's really either hot in here or man, it's really cold in here. And you're just fine. You think it's perfect. It's a relative thing. Or conversely, you might be freezing. And now the driver or passenger is like, oh, yeah, it's perfect. Or vice versa. That means right, water can be both. We call it amphoteric. It can be actually an acid or it can be a base. 